produce an NAD. Remember that we produce two pyruvates per glucose that we started with. All right. So if we want to tally up all the totals for starting with glucose, we have to double everything I'm going to show you up here. All right. Well, let's um, let's talk about the the, the uh, production of acetyl CoA. All right. Um, let's see. This reaction shows us the production of pyruvate that's coming from glycolysis. All right. Pyruvate is oxidized, and I mentioned this uh, previously. It's oxidized in a uh, reaction that requires NAD, as almost all oxidation reactions in the cell do require. Requires NAD, produces NADH. It also produces carbon dioxide. That means that one of those carbons is getting oxidized, and specifically it's this guy right here. The carboxyl group is getting oxidized and released as carbon dioxide. Another thing that's happening here is that there's a coenzyme A. I talked about that briefly uh, a few lectures ago, and I said coenzyme A was like a handle that the cell used to attach itself to fatty acids, indicating that there's a fatty acid out here. The fatty acid in this case is acet acetic acid, acetate. This guy is known as acetyl-CoA. And this guy right here is a very high energy bond. This is another example of what I talked about last time is an activated intermediate. This is an activated intermediate, meaning it has high energy, and it's going to use that energy to donate a part of itself to something else. That's what happens in the first reaction of this, this citric acid cycle that I'll be talking about. OK, uh, what else do I want to say? This uh, reaction uh, is catalyzed by an enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. That's a little bit different than what I showed you last time. Last time we talked about pyruvate decarboxylase. What's the difference between a pyruvate decarboxylase and a pyruvate dehydrogenase? You won't need to distinguish the two in the first place, so just relax when I tell you this. Okay. A decarboxylase, as its name says, removes the, the, a carbon dioxide. It takes a carboxyl group off. Okay. It turns out that the removal of the carboxyl group is not an oxidation. If you were to simply do just take the carboxyl off, what you would produce is acid aldehyde. That's what cells are doing when they're producing ethanol. They produce acid aldehyde, which I said was the hangover material. Then they reduce that to make ethanol. That's if they have no oxygen. So they're using a part of their pyruvate dehydrogenase complex known as pyruvate decarboxylase. They said, don't worry about this. I'm just giving you this to fill out the picture for you. So pyruvate decarboxylase is a part of this complex. The rest of the complex is involved in oxidation, which is what's happening here and why we end up with an acetyl-CoA instead of releasing free acid aldehyde. OK, now you can go back to listening to me again. Do you have a question? Yeah, where's oxygen in all this? There's no oxygen in any of this. So most oxidations don't directly involve oxygen. They involve the loss of electrons. Right, and that's where we have the electron carrier that's going to this guy over here. But you need oxygen to do that. Is nope, no. You need oxygen to have NAD, but you don't need oxygen for the reaction. Okay, and we'll see why that's the case later. So there's most biological oxidations do not involve oxygen directly. We'll see why that's the case next week. Everybody got that? All right. Like I said, you can go back to listening to me now. All right. So um, coenzymes. This guy is a complex enzyme. It uses several factors to help it do what it does, one of which is thiamine pyrophosphate. We saw this last time. Thiamine was vitamin B1. You put a pyrophosphate on it, you've got thiamine pyrophosphate, and that's needed for this enzyme. There's five cofactors that this enzyme requires. Thiamine pyrophosphate called TPP, which you can call it TPP if you want. FAD. FAD helps in the oxidation. It's not shown in this reaction here. Lipoic acid. Lipoic acid turns out to be a very interesting compound. If you want to learn something about life extension and cellular life extension, give me a holler. I'll tell you about some very cool research going on in the OSU campus about lipoic acid. Okay? It needs NAD, and it needs coenzyme A, written as COASH. That's a, that's a sulfur group that's there. 
Magnesium is, a, is, is not a coenzyme, it's just a factor that's needed. But five coenzymes, NAD, FAD, lipoic acid, TPP, and coenzyme A. Okay, so that's the reaction. The product of that is acetyl-CoA. We've produced an NADH. If we started with glucose, we've now got two NADHs and two acetyl-CoAs and two carbon dioxides. All right, we are ready. And we're not going to worry about the mechanism. Don't worry about that. Okay. We are ready to go into the reactions of the citric acid cycle. So we've got an acetyl-CoA. It's now ready to enter that cycle. And when it enters that cycle, what happens is it gets combined with Exaloacetate. There's our friend exaloacetate again. So we saw exaloacetate being produced in the gluconeogenesis process. What if the cell had a bunch of extra exaloacetate sitting around? What would it do? Well, one of the things it might do is convert it into glucose. Okay, so we'll talk about that. All right. In the first reaction, or what I'll call the first reaction, exaloacetate is combined with the two carbons, the acetyl part of the CoA, to make citrate and coenzyme and release free coenzyme A. The reaction is shown here. Okay. This reaction is very, very energetically favorable. Delta G0 prime, very negative. The reason? This guy is an activated intermediate. It donates its energy to putting these things together, and the donation of that energy makes this reaction very energetically favorable. This will become important when we go after we go all the way around the cycle. I'll remind you of that later. This guy is very energetically favorable. The product of this is a six carbon molecule. Now we're going to start counting carbons. We've got a six carbon molecule called citrate or citric acid, same thing. This guy has six carbons and is why we call this the citric acid cycle. This is called by several names, the citric acid cycle. It's called the tricarboxylic acid cycle. That's an older name. Tricarboxyl means three carboxyl groups. One, two, three. Okay. It's also called the Krebs cycle. All three of those names refer, all refer to the same thing. Okay. Next step of the process, we take the citrate and we rearrange it. So here's citrate, and you can write this citrate as carboxyl, carboxyl, carboxyl. When I teach this class in 450, students have to memorize the structures. And I say, OK, let's think about this. Carbon, 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 carboxyl, carboxyl, carboxyl. Very simple. And in the middle, you've got an OH. It's not a difficult structure to learn. In, this first in, in the next reaction of the process, this enzyme, which is the only one that doesn't tell us anything about what it catalyzes, it simply flips that carboxyl group down to the bottom. Okay, It's called a conotase. Now, there's a very interesting compound called fluorocitrate. Fluoro, I'm sorry, fluoroacetate. Fluoroacetate um, is produced in a reaction that starts with fluoroacetate, combines with um, CoA to make fluoroacetyl-CoA. And citrate synthase will combine that with exaloacetate to make fluorocitrate. All fine and dandy. Why do we care about this? Well, we care about this because fluorocitrate is extraordinarily poisonous to aconitase. It will stop aconitase in its tracks and kill the enzyme. It will therefore kill any cell that has fluoroacetate in it. Fluoroacetate was used as a way of killing wolves and coyotes back in the early 1960s. The idea was that you could put it out where wolves and coyotes were found, they would eat this, and they would die. And they were used to try to control the, um, the prevalence of these uh, organisms out in the wild uh, on the rangelands in the 1960s. The idea th being that once we killed them, that we would have this to graze and do whatever we wanted to with it. And it worked very well, a little too well. The problem was that this thing is pretty stable. So after you killed the, the coyotes and wolves, then the uh, birds of prey that came along and picked uh, apart these things were getting these this very same compound in them, and it killed a ton of birds in the process. Fluoroacetate later got banned uh, by the EPA for that um, because uh, of this reason. Fluoroacetate is not something to mess with. Okay, So it happens because the first enzyme, citrate synthase, uses it just fine. It makes this guy, and this guy kills the conotase. Okay? It's almost a suicidal compound. 
citrate synthase makes a poison that kills the next enzyme in the pathway, aconitase. Make sense? People are kind of scrunching up their eyes. Okay, I'll trust that that, that that scrunching up the eyes is just the exam mode for you, so you're all actually understanding it perfectly. The next reaction of the process is the first decarboxylation. The first decarboxylation. This first decarboxylation is also the first oxidation of the citric acid cycle. By the way, that entry of, of, of pyruvate going to acetyl-CoA, that is not part of the cycle. The cycle is only once we get in that circle. Okay, once we get in that circle, we're in the cycle. So that very first oxidation of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA is not part of the citric acid cycle. This is the first oxidation of the cycle. It's a decarboxylation. And in this reaction, the six carbon compound up here is becoming oxidized to a five carbon compound down here. What are we losing? We're losing this guy right here. We're losing that middle carboxyl group. This hydroxyl is becoming oxidized to a ketone. And we produce this compound called alpha ketoglutarate. The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called isocitrate dehydrogenase. Whenever you see the word dehydrogenase in an enzyme name, it means it catalyzes a redox. Pyruvate dehydrogenase catalyzed a redox. This guy, isocitrate dehydrogenase, catalyzes a redox. We see NADH being produced, no surprise, because it's a redox reaction. We also see carbon dioxide produced because we're losing one of the carboxyl groups. Okay. The next step in the process, and by the way, alpha ketoglutarate is a very interesting compound. Alpha ketoglutarate, you put, you replace that oxygen with an amine, you have glutamic acid. So this guy can readily be converted into glutamic acid, and conversely, glutamic acid can readily be converted into alpha ketoglutarate. We're seeing now how this is a central pathway. There's other things that are tying into this. Yes, ma'am? You do not need to know the intermediate here. No, you do not. Yeah, good question. Thank you. So you, need, you only need to know the products of each reaction, none of the intermediates. Now, this is one of the ways somebody asked uh, a, a, a couple lectures ago about how it is that we can get energy from protein. One of the ways we can get it is from right here. We break down protein, we get glutamic acid. We have glutamic acid, we can convert it into alpha ketoglutarate, and we can oxidize that in the citric acid cycle, and bang, we've got energy from protein, and we didn't have to use sugar to do it. Okay. Ah, uh, next reaction. Another decarboxylation, another oxidation. This guy is catalyzed by an enzyme, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Oh boy. Okay. Alpha KGDH. Alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Alpha KGDH. This guy is converting alpha ketoglutarate into succinyl CoA. Anything look familiar in this reaction that we've seen earlier in this lecture? What do you see? Lipoic acid. What else do you see? TPP. What else do you see? Magnesium. What else do you see? CoA. FAD. Okay. This enzyme, not surprisingly, looks very much like pyruvate dehydrogenase and uses almost exactly the same mechanism. It's just working on a different molecule. The same five cofactors that we saw before. Yes? Yes, sure. The name of the enzyme is alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. And you can abbreviate that as alpha KGDH. So alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase and pyruvate dehydrogenase, very similar structures, very similar mechanisms, and they produce very similar molecules. This is succinyl-CoA before we produced acetyl-CoA. This guy has four carbons. The acetyl-CoA had two carbons. <laughs> 